Well, Richard Guccolaire will spend at least the next 33 years in prison for strangling his pregnant wife. When he took her life, he thought that he silenced Amber forever. But he was wrong. Reporter Susan Samples tonight explains how a secret journal helped expose her husband's murderous rage. My wife is, she's not breathing. She's not breathing. What, what's the address? <laughs> and how old is your wife? She's purple. How old and... is your wife? Okay, listen to me. Listen to me. Don't hang up. Richard Gitchelar would later tell police he'd gone to bed that night on a downstairs couch because the couple's bedroom was too hot. But in the middle of the night, he said he awakened to the cries of their baby, whose crib was in the couple's bedroom. When the cries didn't stop, Gitchelar said he went to check on the baby and found his wife, who was pregnant with their third child, dead in the couple's bed. We are doing the best to help you now, okay? You need to just stay on the line. I want you to loosen anything that's around her neck and then tell me if she's breathing. This is not fair. She's purple. Her eyes are bald. Sad. Okay, do you think she's beyond help? I do. I do. God <laughs> She was three days short of her 33rd birthday, a wife and mom who lived her faith every day. Amber Gitchelar taught English as a second language to middle schoolers in Kentwood, a passion sparked by church mission trips to Guatemala. Those who knew Amber say she put God first, then family, especially her beloved girls, two and a half and eight months old, when they lost their mom. <laughs> Are there any kids in the home, or is it just you and her? Yeah, no, my, my daughter's right next to us. She's right okay. here. No, I need you to take her out of the room. <laughs> Sir, I know. I know. Listen to me a minute. Do you think she did this on purpose, or was it an accident? Richard told dispatch his wife of nine years had accidentally strangled herself with a sweatshirt. She had a sweatshirt around her neck, and she's not breathing. What he told police that night obviously wasn't. The truth. Assistant Prosecutor Rachel Wustman said the autopsy made it clear someone had choked Amber to death. She had fresh abrasions and Richard changing stories, none of which added up, said friends and family, including Amber's sister, who lived with the couple but was gone that night. She later told police Richard only slept on the couch if he and Amber were fighting, and he never woke up in the middle of the night because the meds he took for his mental health issues knocked him out. The meds made him angry too, which is why he took them before bed and why Amber jumped to care for the girls at night. He said what made him finally wake up and get up was the, hearing this baby cry. And um, again, you know, her sister said he never got up with the baby. That just wasn't what he did. Indeed, friends told police Richard did so little around the house, Amber basically had three children, the two girls and Richard. One thing he did do, despite Amber's vehement protests, was watch porn, which prompted this angry text exchange a week before the murder. And when Amber's sister asked her what she wanted for birthday, Amber replied, a new husband. Two days later, she was dead. And police, said Westman, had a prime suspect. They said, you know, we've never had the situation before where everyone around these two is saying he did it. Richard's own father told police there was a 98% chance his son was guilty. Richard's sister thought he flew into one of his rages and could not gain control. And his brother told police as a child, Richard threatened to burn down the house and kill the family pets. Still, despite Richard's violent history, it seems no one saw the murder coming. No one, that is, except for Amber herself. What they ended up finding, though, Amber had written down a couple of things in a notebook pad. Inside the console of Amber's minivan, six loose leaf papers turned smoking gun. The woman Richard thought he had silenced would in the end be a star witness in her own murder. 
Amber wrote, I have literally thought to myself, am I safe asleep next to him? Would he ever kill me? She wrote that Richard had beaten her, kicked and punched her through a mug, smashed her cell phones, punched a glass shower door and smashed a counter with a hammer. It's clear though, this was a secret diary. What happens behind closed doors, you know, people don't necessarily see and then when they're both able to cover it up pretty well, you don't really see how bad it's getting. Amber was very strong, very independent. She was very confident. She was also exceptionally close to her mom, Amy DeGraff, who never saw any sign of violence nor the danger her daughter faced. For some reason, she chose to stay in a situation that obviously cost her, her her life. And that is the mystery. I think Amber did a really good job of covering for him. And probably because the kind of person she was, um, you know, she, she was just so loving and caring and I think a fixer. And she always wanted him to be better and, and covered for him. Rachel Wussman doesn't know why the violence turned deadly that night. Because the state could not prove premeditation, Gitchelar pleaded guilty to second degree murder and intentionally assaulting a pregnant person. Police, did you strangle your wife and kill her? Yes, Your Honor. And that was intentional, was that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And you knew that she was pregnant at the time, is that correct? I did, Your Honor. Outside the courtroom the day of the plea, an incredible show of grace by Amy DeGraff to Richard Gitchelar's father. I'm sorry, George, that I don't know why that happened. It was so senseless. Yeah. We're all just broken by this. We're just broken by this. But the DeGraffs are determined to honor Amber and God by helping others. That is our biggest hope, by speaking out about this and by sharing Amber's story, that if someone is in a relationship like this, that Please know it could cost you your life. If you are there in that situation, please, please seek help. That was Susan Samples reporting for us tonight. We know there was just a lot of hurt there. We understand this is a heavy subject. We do want to be able to tell you, though, if you notice red flags in someone else's relationship, experts say the best thing to do is to ask questions, but in a very low-key, non-judgmental way. Domestic violence survivors are often not ready to leave, and talking about life at home can be complicated and very difficult. But opening that door, even if just a little bit, it's a big first step in seeking help. You can also always call the domestic violence hotline that you see right here on your screen. And you can also check our website at qcnews.com for more information. We'll be right back.